Okay, so what we're gonna talk about is uh, a little bit about uh, environmental reconstruction. So the basic thing is how do we go from a real landscape into a database of things that are from that landscape and then back again. Uh, but really pointing out some of the problems in this. Um, this doesn't mean it's impossible or not doable, uh, it just means there are lots of things you need domain experts to point out. Um, but first, Matthias is going to give some of the background and then I'll go into the problems. So. Right, so I'll start off uh, just uh, talking a bit about the database that we work with, SEED, and do some essentially environmental archaeology <coughs> stuff. So SEED has been an ongoing project for since uh, 2008 and it is hosted at the Environmental Archaeology Lab at Umeå University. It is a multi-proxy database and uh, it is being maintained together with the Digital Humanities Laboratory at Umeå University. And the overall goal of SEED is to make uh, environmental archaeology data, paleoecological data available to the research community but also to develop on different online tools that they can use to explore and analyze this data. Uh, so something that we really want to do is encourage people to not only focus on their specific data type but also s explore how it relates to other data types. So it's going back to the data arc project as well. Um, we have an, a current uh, prototype web browser called QSeed, and uh, we are the dig or the digital humanities laboratory are developing a new prototype called SuperSeed, uh, which is still, however, in its early stages. But you can access it, and we appreciate any input that you have on it. Uh, Seed is also the infrastructure for. Archive, which is a Swedish uh, consortium of archaeological laboratories, but even more so it is part of a much bigger network. SEED provides data to different databases and infrastructures, and uh, they're not only archaeological ones like the digital atlas of the Roman Empire, but transdisciplinary networks like Data Arc, or paleoecological databases like Neotoma, or recently a biodiversity database called Swedish Lifewatch. And these in turn are connected to other databases, infrastructures, forming this much bigger interdisciplinary network, which you see this one part of. So going back to the data in SEED, um, when you look at a landscape, you can divide it into different landscape elements. So identifying areas with a lot of dead wood, areas with still water, areas affected by grazing, areas affected by people. And these different, it's essentially a way of classifying the landscape and environment to make it easier for us to analyze and work with it. And these landscape elements come with their own indicators. So there, these indicators are different proxies, like uh, organisms like insect, insects and plants, but also the different uh, chemical and physical properties of the soils and the sediments. Uh, so these are proxies for the different types of landscape elements. And over time, these will enter the paleo-environmental record. So they will end up in different uh, contexts like peat sediments, lake sediments, and also become a part of the uh, archaeological si soil, the archaeological soils that we work with. And as naturally as the landscape changes, so if you have a landscape like this one, uh, a more deciduous forest type of landscape, uh, where where you find different a certain type of pollen, certain types of insects. Uh, as it changes into a more coniferous uh, forest, naturally the pollen uh, that you find in the paleo environmental record will change, but also the different types of insects, because uh, they are attracted to certain types of environments. So if the forest that they 
like they throw away thriving changes, the insects will move away, away and new ones will enter in their stead. And as we continue to study the paleo environmental record, we may pick up certain anomalous evidence, uh, or what we interpret to be anomalous ed evidence, contrary to the uh, naturally changing environment. So we may start to find uh, fleas and dung beetles. And these uh, are often connected to the human presence at the site. So these different types of proxies uh, that environmental archaeologists, that paleoecologists uh, extract from the paleoenvironmental record uh, are what we store in seed. Yep. Okay. So we have a database, and or, and lots of people have databases. And the question is, how do we get back to reconstructing landscapes? This is this is quite basic stuff, really. Um, but what are the implications for this in terms of linking data through these environmental concepts uh, or elements or traits, whatever you want to call them, to other data sources. We went a bit over the top on the animations here, but it feels like it's, it's time for animation to become trendy again, I think. So you saw we added one extra thingy there. Where is, is there a pointy thing? There we yeah. Ecology, so a lot of this is done through, um, through uh, mapping our paleoecological data or the, the elements that we, we uh, measure to modern ecology data. Here's an example from the database. This is, this is Super C, the programmer who named that was really, really happy with the name that way. Um, it's both Super and it's Super Seeds. Yeah. So if we look in the database for deciduous woodland, then we can get out a list of all the species which are described by ecologists and biologists to live in deciduous woodland. Now we're talking about the insects. You, of course, can do this with all the plants as well. Uh, we can look at all the different sites where there are indications of deciduous woodland through the insects in the database. And you can just export those data. Um, but what is maybe more interesting is to try and look at how changes in the different proportional representations of these... I keep walking for the microphone proportional representation of these different environmental indicators change over time uh, and space and that is what gives us uh, landscape change and climate change um, uh, descriptions you could say. Uh, one thing to remember here is it's not simple depending on where you take your samples in this case as a core you will get different biases, different proportional representations, different levels of preservation so here we've used colour and size just as a way of indicating how this can vary in the samples. Now I'm going to say something controversial. Aggregating on space and time is easy compared to the next stage, which we'll explain. So you can aggregate geographically, you can aggregate chronologically. These are simple database queries. I'm not saying it is simple to do, but relatively speaking, that's a lesser problem. Uh, but considered often to be the most complicated problem. So if we take an example, deciduous woodland. Um, deciduous woodland, in terms of the insects, you've got all these species which are require deciduous trees for their survival. So they are direct proxies for a deciduous tree, maybe a leaf or the wood. Uh, in the landscape, of course, of deciduous woodland, you may have other components, such as dry dead wood, if this is a, an ancient forest, say, and this is a very hotly debated subject at the moment and the as soon as you get people in the theory is the dry dead wood starts disappearing you lose those species from the environment this is a nice example of things that beetles can tell you that pollen can't because dead wood doesn't have pollen yeah uh, you get other components in the landscape maybe there's a, a small pond or a lake or some indication of water there but of course this is not it's never that simple there are also background evidences for other aspects of the landscape some of these are transported in from further distance, but also you get an understory vegetation which will vary depending on your uh, type of woodland. So deciduous woodland is beginning to become a more and more complex um, concept depending on which evidence you're looking at and the more evidence you add, the more complicated it gets. Then we should also remember that deciduous woodland may not be the thing that some of our environmental indicators or even people are responding to. A deciduous woodland is going to be warmer, 
more humid, it's going to be sheltered in contrast to a surrounding more open landscape. And that could be what our environmental data is telling us, not especially deciduous woodland. It's just the climate context gives us deciduous woodland. It could be um, coniferous woodland in a different one. Our dry dead wood could be construction timber. Uh, and of course, this is all a bit of propaganda for multi-proxy and multi-subject interdisciplinary studies. Of course, the archaeology will give you the timber. An example of what that looks like if we are to plot it uh, and this is the example that Rachel showed. And this is a, a, um, an aggregation of the environmental indicators from a Roman well at the margin of Sherwood Forest. So this is dated to, um, if I remember, it's somewhere around 200 AD. Um, what we can see in this example is there is about a 10% indication of uh, deciduous, oh, sorry, of wood or trees. And remember, wooden trees here is rather than woodland is very important, and about a one to two percent indication of deciduous woodland. Uh, these are two different ways of treating the same data. The top one we've just looked at species biodiversity. Second one we've looked at the uh, the numbers of individuals per species as well as species diversity. And here you can see dung beetles gather in larger groups, and so you that sounds a bit strange. But if you were to look at the numbers of individuals who may get an over-representation of domestic animals or grazing animals, which may be true, may not be true, it's a tool, it's not an answer. So our conclusion in here, in this context, is this is not a deciduous woodland. This is Sherwood Forest with its fields with some hedges. Uh, we can compare that to many, many other things because we have these databases. We can do very, very simple queries which give us massive amounts of data and big headaches to try and understand. Luckily, this one was really nice because the uh, Roman wells gave both statistically similar, uh, well, they clustered together in terms of the biodiversity. They also gave reasonably similar um, environmental reconstructions and the Bronze Age water holes, we're not calling them wells, also clustered, so that was a nice thing. But you see, here we've got 20% woodland for a Roman site in Wales, whereas we've got down to 9% here. Uh, and here we have more indications of deciduous woodland. So there are a lot of nuances coming up in this. Another example, really ugly diagram, because the other one, that's done for an archaeological journal. This is for quaternary science, and things are less pretty in quaternary science. Um, and it costs money to publish colour. So here, this is a, a uh, late glacial sequence, uh, end of the last ice age. Uh, we have indications of wood and trees here going between uh, 9 to up to 15%, a little bit of deciduous there. Here we actually conclude this is deciduous woodland, even though it's exactly the same numbers as we had in our Roman, will con uh, Roman well context. The reason is, connecting this to the climate data, thinking about the scale of the samples, how many thousands, hundreds of years the different samples represent, and also looking at the total biodiversity in the samples. It's a richer environment. So same numbers, same concepts that we would map to other data sources, different conclusions. If we then think in the data arc perspective of mapping these things to other sources, uh, We've got to think about all the different nuances that are going to be involved in all the different sources as well. Um, here we have literature saying that Robin pranced around in the oaks with the peasants, but when we look at the art, which is supposed to be describing this period, we see that Robin actually pranced around with arist aristocrats in the forest. But then we look at our environmental archaeology evidence, we see that's complete rubbish. Uh, but it's all useful, and it all tells us different things. So, to wrap back to the, to the title here, the grand challenge is not integrating the data, it's integrating the complexities through simple concepts and uh, making sure people who do these linkings actually work with people who understand all the different bits, or at least go out and ask them. So, you know, and we're all guilty of not doing that, even us. Um, yeah, various websites, try it all out, tell us what's wrong with it, and come with suggestions.